In 1911, Amundsen and Scott had to complete their expeditions in less than 100 days during summertime because they were not equipped to camp during autumn or winter at the South Pole. Captain Scott, after reaching the South Pole five weeks later than the Norwegian Amundsen, died from exhaustion, starvation and frostbite on their way back home. In 1990, the transantarctic expeditions retraced this adventure, but the six explorers from six different nations cross unhurriedly the Antarctic continent from one edge to the other in 220 days during spring, summer and autumn. Advancement in material science and garment design slightly changed the approach of the explorer to the big chill. How was this change possible? The South Pole is hostile to humans. In wintertime, temperature can drop to minus 70. You may know that cold is not only a matter of temperature, but also a matter of wind. And this feeling can be expressed as a formula, the wind chill factor. The average temperature of skin is 33. And when this formula is equal to 2,400, our exposed flesh will freeze in one minute only. To have a reference, when temperature is minus 30 and no ventilation, pretty mild conditions at the South Pole, we are not risking frostbite. But if wind is only 30 kilometers per hour, just like a summer breeze, the wind chill factor reaches the fearsome value of 2,200. In other words, great risk of frostbite. In such extreme conditions, what will save us? Only our garments. It is vital that they are perfectly designed for the big chill. We can be inspired by indigenous inhabitants who have very thick fours. Interestingly enough, it's not the fur itself being insulating, but hair and trap in between hair. Air is the perfect insulating material. Air is twice as insulating as wool. Under the microscope, the polar bee hair is hollow inside and filled with air. Inspired by that, today polar jacket can be filled with hollow polyester fibers. These fibers are curly, so that the fluffy padding will entrap plenty of air inside and in between the fibers. However, you must be sure that air is still and is not flowing through your garment. If wind is slipping in your wristband or collar, this is a completely different story. Wind will remove it quickly from your body. And this is known as pumping effect. Indigenous inhabitants avoid pumping effect by having thick fours where wind cannot penetrate. By the way, the polar bear skin is black. Infrared waves responsible for eating are conveyed through each hollow fiber and reach the black skin, which absorbs more radiation than pale skin. Something similar has been developed in textiles called far infrared materials. They are capable of reflecting body, radi uh, body radiation back to you, improving microcirculation, which is crucial in cold conditions. The penguin plumage and the polar bear four has another nice feature. They are water resistant and polar garment must be water-resistant. Amundsen and Scott could barely dream of breathable membranes, which allows at the same time your body perspi perspiring. Today, there are even membranes whose porosity is regulated by human temperature, called thermosensible membranes. If you are cold, the porosity of the membrane is low, 
and your body preserves it. If you're hot, the porosity increases and allows greater extent of perspiration. Because even at minus 30, you may sweat, and sweat must be removed from skin as soon as possible. Yes, you can sweat at minus 30. Besides environmental conditions, the thermal balance of the human body depends on the metabolic rate. In other words, it depends on the physical activity you are doing. The explorer's job can be demanding. Either you are climbing or skiing or pulling a heavy sledge. You must do some work. Like in case of a car, we can speak in terms of how our body efficiency. Unfortunately, we are poor machines, and our efficiency cannot exceed 20, 25 percent. So, only a small fraction of the biochemical energy produced by cells through burning food will be converted into mechanical work for climbing, skiing. The rest will be converted into heat. More work, more heat. Even at minus 30, your body temperature starts to rise, and your thermoregulatory system will promptly have to keep her under control by sweating. Evaporation of sweat is the most effective way to get rid of heat. But sweating at minus 30 can be dangerous. Here is the perfect insulating material, do you remember? Well, water, and sweat is mainly water, is the opposite. It conducts heat pretty well. If air is substituted by sweat, your garment will lose dramatically their insulating properties. As soon as you stop working hard, you will start freezing because you are no longer producing big amount of heat by metabolism and your garments are no longer protecting you because they are soaked with sweat. The strategy for not sweating at the South Pole is, as we Italians say, dress like an onion. Four layers, you must wear many layers and in case you feel hot, you will remove one layer. Four layers fulfill the need of an explorer, even at the South Pole. The first, first layer, close to skin, is tight-fitting, it covers the whole body. Its aim is mainly removing perspiration from skin. Wool or polypropylene garments are the best at first layer. The intermediate layers, one or two, are medium to heavy layers of insulation. Uh, normally polyester pile and trapping plenty of air. Finally, the outer layer is a water-resistant shell protecting you from snow and wind. You must protect yourself from snow and wind, piercing the smallest openings. It is important how, garm how fabrics are put together in a garment stitchings and zips, if not designed properly, they can frustrate the job of the most insulating fabric. Thermography can help in identifying the source of heat loss from your garment. The trekking shoe was heated from inside, and what was discovered? The brightest areas are less insulated than the darkest areas. These areas represent head sink. So, when designing garments for the South Pole, sewings, unnecessary zips, they should be avoided, or at least they should be covered by a windstopper strip. Progress has been made also in the regard. With the seamless knitting machines, garments can be produced in one single piece without sewing. There are people facing extremely cold conditions every day. 
Take, for instance, workers of the oil plants in the North Sea, or butchers spending hours in refrigerating rooms. These people have the same needs as explorers. Very often, they have to manipulate small objects, and these require the hands are not stiff frozen. Advancement in garment designs and material will help these people to do better in their jobs. Despite the progress of the past century, many products are expected to come. Smart materials, which sense and react to the environment, will be more and more implemented in garments. Or wearable technology can inform a person if finger temperature is too low and he or she may suffer from frostbite. Or device can be introduced in garments, providing warmth by electrical eating. Now, let's go back to this, to Amundsen and Scott. Many pages have been written about these two men. The reason of success of the first and failure of the second, the dogs, the skis, the horses. But if you look at this picture, you will see that they were dressed very differently. The Norwegian man in his culture did know that fur was the best choice at that time, much better than the English wool sweater of Captain Scott. Amundsen himself used to say, I would call any expedition without fur clothing in a greatly equipped. And now you know why. It is because of air. Thank you.